those days it came to pass, while Apollo was at Corinth, that Paul, having passed through the upper coasts, came to Ephesus and found certain disciples. And he said to them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since ye, ye believed? But they said to him, We have not so much as heard whether there be a Holy Ghost. And he said, And what, and what then were you baptized? Who said, In John's baptism. Then Paul said, John baptized the people with the baptism of penance, saying that they should believe in him who was to come after him, that is to say, in Jesus. Having heard these things, they were baptized in the name of, our, of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had imposed his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came upon them, and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. And all the men were about twelve, and entering into the synagogue, he spoke boldly for the space of three months, disputing and exhorting concerning the kingdom of God. Is in the gospel. Taking that according to St. John, chapter 14. At that time, Jesus said to his disciples, If you love me, keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another paraclete, that he may abide with you forever, the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, nor knoweth him. But you shall know him, because he shall abide with you, and shall be in you. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. Yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more. But you see me, because I live, and you shall live. In that day you shall know that I am in, in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. And he that hath my commandments, and keepeth them, he is, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father. And I will love him, and will manifest myself to him. Those are the words of today's Holy Gospel. In the Father, and the Son, and the Ghost, Amen. <coughs> Gospel today, taken again from the Last Supper, I mean these Gospels of the recent days and this time after after Ascension, taken from the speech of our Lord during the Last Supper, and he says, I will not leave you orphans, I will not leave you orphans, a few considerations today taken in large part from St. Augustine, but also remember in 1987, Archbishop of Lefebvre in 88 said to the seminarians and the priests of the society, his old bishop is about to die. And we have the worry about the continuation of the Catholic faith, the continuation of the Catholic priesthood, the continuation of the work of the Holy Ghost in our church down the last 2,000 years in the 20th century. And the great prelate of the 20th century then said, I will not leave you orphans. I will not leave you orphans. I will not leave you orphans is one of the essential elements of our holy faith. It goes along with the word of St. Paul, Tradidi Quaternachepi, I have handed down what I have received. And that we are Catholics who receive what our ancestors gave to us and carry it on. Therefore our Lord, when he leaves, he leaves as I will not leave you orphans. As St. Augustine says, the first thing we must consider is that only a father and only a son can speak of orphanage, of orphans. If an employer has a worker and he leaves him unemployed, he is just unemployed. He can go to another employer. But there's something about father and son that is irreplaceable. No one can really take the place of a father. And the father and the son, they have a, a unique bond. And when the father dies, when the father ceases to function in the life of the son, when the father goes away, the son is an orphan. So the first thing we note about this as St. Augustine is I will not leave you orphans. It already says, first of all, that we are sons. We are the sons of God. We are the sons of our Lord Jesus Christ. We are the sons of the Father. But we are intimately brought into the family of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he's speaking this most especially to his priests. But in fact he's speaking to all Catholics. To all souls. 
I will not leave you orphans. I have made you my son. I have taken away the original sin from you. I have taken away the actual sins and baptized you. I have taken away all the wickedness and made you a member of my mystical body. I have made you recognizable to the Father, and you are truly called sons. And now I am going to die. And now I am going to go away. And you will feel as though you are abandoned by your Father. You will feel as though your Father is not there. This will be the great pain that enters into your heart. The absence of fatherhood will be one of the greatest pains that anyone that follows Christ can experience. They felt this absence, especially at 3 p.m. on Good Friday, when they heard him cry out with a loud voice. And he gave up the ghost. And his last words, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. But he was no longer speaking, and he was gone to them. And they were felt as though they were orphans. They were sons without a father, and they were in the most great agony. The first thing we can note about this statement, says St. Augustine, is that we are sons. We were not sons before. We were not sons when we were born as uh, the, with original sin in our hearts and our souls, but now we're sons. But then what happens? The son sees his father die. The son sees his father give up the ghost. The son sees his father no longer moving. His father no longer speaking. He watches his father be buried. And he's lost. He is completely lost. And our Lord knows this is the case. And had he not spoken these words during the Last Supper, they would have surely died of grief. They didn't believe that he was going to come back, but they couldn't imagine that, he, that our life without him. And he told them, I will come back. I will not leave you orphans, I will return. And there are many returnings of Christ. St. Augustine speaks about these returnings. First thing he says, he does not return to everyone. And this he makes it clear in the next words of the, of the passage in the, in, the, in the Gospel of St. John, chapter 14. He's speaking about the indwelling. He shall, he, when whom the world is, nor cometh to me, and he shall abide with you. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more. So right now, in his public ministry, in his visible publicity, the world sees Christ, and the apostles see Christ. This is important to recognize. God gives a grace of salvation, sufficient grace to go to heaven, to every human being on earth. In order to get that sufficient grace, we have to see Christ. In order to get that sufficient grace, we have to see him. And everyone sees him. Caiaphas sees him. Judas sees him. Annas sees him. Herod sees him. Pilate sees him. All the crowd sees him. The soldiers see him. The apostles and the holy women see him. The women of Jerusalem who will not be saved, they also see him. The children in their arms see him. The passers-by see him. All see him. Everyone sees him. Whosoever reacheth the age of reason sees Christ. They will all see him. But then they will all see him disappear. All shall see him disappear. His enemies and his friends alike. And here he speaks to the apostles and he says, But the world shall see me no more. Not everyone shall see him return. And one of the fathers tell us, When grace visits, shall it revisit? St. Alphonsus says, There is one grace that shall be your last. There is one gift that shall be your last. There is one time when our Lord shall come and say, Come to me, step away from your sins, accept the grace, and we shall say no, and he shall not return. He spoke to the, the, the Pharisees, and he spoke to the Sadducees, and he said, You shall die in your sins. He spoke to, Saint, to Judas, and he said, it was better for this man that he had not been born. And they see him no more. All receive the grace necessary to be saved, but the world shall see him no more. But what about the friends? They shall see him, and they shall see him again. And they shall see him, and they shall see him again. 
These are what St. Teresa of the Child Jesus, or rather St. Teresa of Avila, would refer to as the seven stages of the interior castle, or the stages of the supernatural life. As our Lord comes into our souls, he is first visible in the flesh. He is first visible in his words. And this visibility is to all men. The Satanists know Christ. They know that he is God. The Satanists know God. They know the commands of God, and they reject them, and they hear his words. This is the external. But they do not ever accept the love of him. They do not ever accept the faith. And there are many such souls in our world today. And the Lord appears, and then he disappears. He comes, and then he goes away. And the first going away is physical. We see him die on the cross. It's happening right now in the church in the last 50 years in a very visible manner since Vatican II. We can see the church dying. We can see the church going away. We can see there's almost nothing left of it. Just a few days ago, we had one of our wandering visitors pass through the seminary in Kentucky. And uh, he's a Catholic young man. He wandered in and then he wandered out, stayed for us the day, but interesting day. But as he wandered in, he's, you know, he's, he's new to the faith. Young man. Only been a Catholic for a few years. Do you say the 50, do you say the rosary, the 15 decades? Well, actually, there's, there's 20 decades. The Hail Mary? Well, there's the Holy Spirit. We brought every single subject, every single thing that our ancestors handed down to us. He has a different version. Every single detail. As if it comes from another religion. And the religion that was handed down is visibly dead. It seems dead. They don't know what the Hail Mary is. They don't know what Fatima is. They don't know what the battle of the devil is. They don't know what the commandments are. They don't know any of it. And then the saints. Today is a saint of Nimba Wimba of Africa. Nimba Wimba of Africa. Yeah, he was, uh, you know, he like had a great devotion to John Paul II and died of hemorrhoids. <laughs> now the fact is, so that now we don't even know what saints are. We don't know what the fathers are. We don't know what the Hail Mary is. And all of the visibility, it's like all the blood of Christ is shed forth. It's all separated from the body. It's all dropped on the ground. And the church seems to be visibly dead. And we are appear to be left as orphans. But Christ says, I will return. I will return. But I will not return to everyone. There will be many souls that I will not return to. And so it is in the crisis of the church, Christ will return. And one of the things we know about the crisis of the church is that when this particular crisis ends, there will be great bloodshed. There will be many souls dying, perhaps the majority of souls. The common opinion is that the majority of souls on the earth, the majority of the seven billion people on the earth today will die. And only a few shall live past the chastisement. The majority of these souls shall never see Christ. We shall die the enemies of God. But the good will also buy, die with the dead, with the bad, so that there will also be saints and the just amongst them that die. But the majority will not be the friends of God. The majority Christ shall not revisit. Because the souls have turned so much away from God. They hate so much his whole being. They say whole, so much his whole essence. They hate everything about him. Every single thing. And so he says to the apostles, I won't leave you orphans. To them he returns. And when he returns, it's the 40 days, which ended a couple of days ago. The second returning. And that returning is simply to prove to the apostles, it's me. It's the same one. So when we look for the return of the church, the first thing we can look for is, are there ten commandments in the new church that's come back? Are there twelve articles of the creed in the, 12, in the church that's come back? Is there the teaching of all the gospel in the church that's come back? Is the external teaching of the church the same? Can I put my fingers into the hands and see that it's the same hand that was nailed to the cross before Vatican II? Can I put my hand on the side and see it's the same morality and the same gospel that was before Vatican II? Am I going to be able to see visibly the same things? And this is the first return. The first return is the physical return. And Christ returns. 
And they don't believe it's him at first. But through miracles and through putting their hands into his side and through watching him eat fish and through seeing him appear to many, many, many souls over the case course of 40 days, they believe Christ has returned and he has not left me an orphan. But he's not finished returning. Notice on the day of the ascension, what does he tell his apostles? He says to them, he upbraided them and he corrected them. And he chastised them before he went to heaven because they were slow to believe, because they doubted. And hence we can see in our present crisis in the church that when its visible side comes to an end, there will be many souls that doubt that it has come to an end. There will be many souls that are not sure and that will not believe. When the miracle of the Blessed Virgin Mary takes place and heaven returns its life and the Holy Ghost returns its life back into the church, and the bishops convert, and the pope converts, and the priests convert, and come back to God. Many will doubt, even though they will see the evidence. Others will see the evidence and note that Christ has truly returned. And because of this, note also the devil, knowing these things, will create false resurrections. This is, in fact, what, the, what Bishop Fillet believes in right now. He believes in a false resurrection. And many conservatives in the church believe in a false resurrection that the crisis is more or less over because John Paul II did consecrate Russia to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. And uh, this is one of the things the young man told us. And they, they consecrated the Immaculate Heart of Mary. And Sister Lucia said it happened. Which, of course, isn't true. It doesn't matter. It sounds good. And so the fact is, therefore, it must have happened. And there we see already as the crisis of the church is more or less we're struggling, but it's more or less over. And we see there's a return. But is it a return of the same body that was before? Or is it a different body? Is it the same nails in the same place in the hands? The same nails in the, and the same spear in the same place in the side? Is it the same body? Is it the same Christ? It turns out it's not. Therefore, it's not a resurrection. So the first return is that we will note that Jesus Christ, who comes back after he had seems to disappear, is the same Christ, the same doctrine, the same morals, the same everything in his external teaching and manifestations. He's not going to add a new teaching. He's not going to subtract an old one. But this return also is physical. And it's necessary for us to get our faith, to keep our faith. But then he chastises the apostles, and he will return again. He goes on Ascension Thursday. And on Pentecost, tomorrow at 9 o'clock in the morning, he returns and this time he returns and is the next return of, the, of Christ. And St. Augustine says it's not the final return. For each time that he goes, he's pruning the tree. He's pruning the tree of our souls. Because what is he trying to do? What is our Lord trying to do? He is trying to form Christ, God the Father, and God the Holy Ghost, and the Blessed Virgin Mary are assisting the forming of Christ inside of us. I must be a Christian that is a follower and an imitator of Christ. This is what we truly are, Christians. A follower and imitator of Christ. The words of Christ must come out of my mouth. The heart of Christ must be inside of my breast. The actions of Christ must be in my feet and my hands. Christ must become a part of me, and who sees me must see Christ. But this does not happen automatically. This takes time, like the forming of a baby to grow into an adult. It takes time. It takes the formation of souls. And Christ will visit many times those that are his friends. But those who reject him, they'll never get past the first visitation. They know that Christ is real, as the Satan is snow, and all men know God is real. There is one God, and he shall judge them when they die. Even the atheist knows that. But when they but they see it only from the outside. They see it only in a cold manner. They don't enter into the reality of Christ's mystery. But we come back in. That's why our Lord allows us to be pruned during life. He allows us to experience sorrows. He allows us to experience disappointments. He allows us to be cut off. He allows us to feel sometimes that he's not there so that he can make us grow. As one as St. Augustine, I believe it is, says <coughs> that, that the soul is much like flowers. And that they receive their strength and during the day, but they only grow at night. And God made our soul in this manner so that it grows in the night. We get strength in the night. We receive the strength, we receive the food, we receive the rays of the sun during the day. But when we sleep at night, that is when our bodies are rejuvenated. And that is when we come back to life. And we rise stronger than we were before, after the night. 
And so it must be in our souls. There will be a little nights that we must experience from time to time. We are in such a night and many such nights right now. So the physical return, he will not leave us orphans. The second return, he comes in the Holy Ghost. Where he lets the faith and supernatural charity begin to enter the soul. So that we live in the state of sanctifying grace. And no longer always in the state of sin. We begin to live in Christ. But then he will return again. And the next return will be that of the apostles. Where the apostles, after they receive the Holy Ghost, they will then go out alone. They'll go out alone to India. They'll go out alone to Syria. They'll go out alone to all the ends of the earth. To Africa, to Europe, the United States, etc. They'll go to all the extremes of the earth. And they will carry Christ in their bodies. They will carry Christ in their words. They will carry Christ in their hearts. Which is why their feet will be blessed. Which is why the scripture tells us, blessed are the feet of the carriers of the gospel of peace. They will carry Christ physically inside of them. And this is the role of the apostles down the last 2,000 years. And it's the third coming of Christ. And then he will show himself in miracles. And this is shown also, say the saints, that there will be miracles. Miracles of grace in the soul. And there will be miracles, also external miracles. Little ones and big ones which will show signs that Christ is there. And there will be signs that will follow the presence of Christ. They will take harmful things, but it will not hurt them. They will drink poison, but it will not hurt them. They will, they will go and bless and cure the sick. And these things have been happening for the last 2,000 years in the church. And they are a coming of Christ. They are a coming. And the final coming is when the Father comes in his fullness of his fatherhood, says Augustine. He will come to judge. And when he comes to judge, he will judge all those who have persecuted his sons. He will judge all those that have isolated and persecuted and done evil to his sons. And he will take his sons on his right side and gather them into the barn and gather them into his, into his side. And that he will come as a father on the day of judgment. And when we see our father come on the day of judgment, there will be great joy in all his sons. But those that are not his sons, they will not see father, they will see judge. And they will have great terror, and they will have reason to be afraid. Because when a man comes, and he sees that someone has done a crime, he punishes the crime. But if the crime is done to his son, if the crime is done to his own blood, he is likely to be far more cruel, far more strict, far more exact in his punishment. And so in order that we might understand the seriousness of the punishment of Jesus Christ when he returns at the end of the world, he will come as a father judging his sons. And his sons who have been faithful shall be gathered under his wing. And those that have persecuted his sons, those that have attacked his sons, they shall receive the most hellish punishment in hell. And it's recorded in the book of Wisdom. Behold how they are in the bosom of God, but we suffer the just reward. We suffer. So say the souls in hell. And so, in any case, Christ comes. He will never leave us orphans. And then he also says to those that carry his gospel, we should never leave orphans. Now how is it that we are not going to leave orphans? We have to build something that will survive after we die. The father is going to die. He's going to physically disappear. He must leave himself. How does he leave himself? It's recorded in the book of Tobias. That Tobias had a son like unto his own name, like unto himself, that he gave his own name. And not only gave it his own name, he gave his own spirit. He gave his own heart to his son, so that he was rightly called Tobias Jr. And to, when Tobias the Sr. died, Tobias lived in Tobias Jr. And so it is in our church. Our ancestors have been dying for the last 2,000 years. The bishops have died. The saints have died. The fathers of families have died. The, the, all the hermits and the nuns and the brothers and the monks and the sisters, they have all died, but they have left themselves in their children, in their supernatural children and in their physical children. They have left themselves, and they live. They live inside of us. The gospel must live inside of us. It must be transformed, transferred, and hence we must always not leave orphans. What must we do? Build for the future. We have a little parish. We want to build this parish up. We have a, we have a seminary. We must build it up. We have, we have the work of the teaching of the faith. We must build it up. To what purpose? That when the time comes that we die, the faith 
that has been handed down to us by our fathers shall be handed down to our sons, and it shall not die. And the faith that was carried in our fathers, carried in us, will be carried in our children and children's children until the very end of the world. And hence they shall not be left orphans. And then when the judge comes in his final visit, he shall come only as a judge to those that are his enemies. He will come as a father revisiting his sons who shall not be left orphans. And so we must not be left orphans and nor leave the, orf leave, leave the church as orphanage. And Archers of the Fev, he saved our holy church. When he said, I will not leave you orphans, he did not only leave four bishops to consecrate and ordain priests. He left the Holy Roman Catholic faith in the church. He left the hope for the future. And he left many families who have the ability to save their souls because of what he did. He did not only consecrate four bishops. He did not only say the mass. He did not only teach the faith. He taught it and said it and lived it in such a way that it spread through the whole of the church and he passed it on to us so that we are not orphans. We're the true sons of our children of heaven. And we must not leave orphans behind us. And God will make sure that it doesn't happen. So long as we have a deep faith and so long as we pass it on wherever we are, he'll make sure that there are not orphans. I will not leave you orphans, but I will come to you again. How does the devil want to make us orphans? To make us become like unto the world. Which is why in the very next verse, and the world shall see me no more. And then in John chapter 17, a few chapters later, I pray not for the world. And so what's the worst thing that can happen to us? To become of the world. Satanists have converted and repented and become the friends of God. When we enter the spirit of the world, and the spirit of the world deeply enters our heart, Christ says, I pray not for the world, and the world shall see me no more. And while there are three temptations, the world, the flesh, and the devil, the one most to be feared is the temptation of the world. Because the temptation of the world makes us live like unto the devil, makes us be in the family of the devil, but we don't feel that bad. We don't feel that sick. We don't feel guilty. And hence, we cannot repent. This is the most powerful of the three temptations, the temptation of the world. To make people live in sin, believing that it's not sin, even though in their hearts they know that it is. To make people live like unto the devil, but not so bad that it's too obvious, and hence they are beyond redemption. Many people now, can't count the number of people who have told me in the last few years, the last few years, that they're good people, and then a little bit later, I'm beyond redemption. Just a, a few weeks ago, another case. I'm beyond redemption. If he's a good person, he's just beyond redemption. If he's really good, then why is he beyond redemption? And many souls are beyond redemption. They are of the world. They will not leave the world. The world is in their heart. The world is in their blood. And the world shall see me no more, says Christ. And I pray not for the world. We don't want to go outside the prayer of Christ. We don't want to go out. Oh, this is why. The way the devil is greatly destroying the SSPX today, of course, the liberalism is there in the teaching, which is terrible. But they're changing the people to be of the world in their hearts and balanced and good of the world. And, and, and there, since you're of the world, you can still be of Christ of the world at the same time. And hence, repentance is morally impossible. I can convert any soul through a miraculous intervention, but it is morally impossible. This is what the devil is after. To make us of the world, because he knows the world will not see Christ anymore, and the world is not prayed for by Christ. Therefore, let it be as our greatest fear to not be of the world. Not, not the world be in our hearts, and not the world be in our being. But we want to be the followers of Christ, and when the world crucifies Christ, and the flesh crucifies Christ, and the devil crucifies Christ, we weep, and we wait for him to return, and we know that he will return. And St. Augustine mentions the four returning, the physical returning of the, of the ascension, the returning in the Holy Ghost. The returning in the apostles, and the returning as a judge at the end of the world. And all these full returnings will be wonderful for us. And each of the returning shall make us go deeper and deeper into the sonship of our Lord Jesus Christ. Until we are with him in the kingdom of heaven. So God bless you all. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost.